will tell the wondrous story how my lost estate to save in his boundless love and mercy he the ransom freely gave sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free i will praise my dear redeemer his triumphant power i'll tell how the victory he given over sin and death and hell sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free take a verse and greet those around you Continue singing with number 404, number 404, the way of the cross. Number 404. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. And I never get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. I must needs go on in the blood-sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights sublime where the soul is at home with God, the way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. On the last, then I bid farewell to the way of the world, to walk in it nevermore. 
Poor my Lord says, come and I seek my home where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Wonderful singing. You may be seated. Well, we're glad to have you here in this Wednesday night service. If you're visiting with us tonight, we have several here. Then uh, one of the ushers should have given you a package. Has anyone didn't receive a welcome packet here when you came in? Anyone didn't receive a welcome packet? So uh, if you, inside that welcome packet, there's a card. If you'll fill that card out at the end of the service, uh, go back to the welcome center there in the bookstore, and they will give you this book, the Bible Promise Book. So fill that card out and bring that back to them, and they'll give that uh, book to you uh, tonight. We're glad to have you here with us. Pastor Dan and his wife, they're on a little vacation this week, and they should be back on Friday. Fellowship Track League is one of the missions that we support here at uh, the church, and they sent this letter. It gives some testimonies of some individuals that uh, use their tracks. And we've been using their tracks for a number of years, and they, we use them here at the church, but, but they're sent out throughout all the world. And uh, he tells about a lady in her 80s, and this is uh, what he says about her. A lady in her 80s called to order tracks recently, and told one of the ladies in the office that she never leaves the house without tracks because she doesn't want people to think she's backslidden. How's that? <laughs> she said if she gets downstairs and, uh, to the bus without tracks, she makes them wait while she goes back upstairs to get some more. There's a faithful lady. And here's another story about a, a daughter, a daughter who wrote to order tracks for her 89-year-old father and shared how he was saved during the Korean War as a result of a Navy chaplain. After the service, he had, after being in the service, he attended Bible college, and then he served as a missionary to Morocco. And uh, when he returned to the States, he started riding a scooter to the local store to pass out tracts. Now he sits in front of the driver's license center, handing out tracts five days a week. There's a faithful, uh, faithful uh, servant of the Lord. Here's another one. We had... On, on Sunday night, we had uh, Michael that was here, and he did a tremendous job, and we were all touched by his, his testimony that he gave and uh, from being a Muslim. Boy, what a tremendous testimony he gave. I had the opportunity. I took him out to, to lunch on Monday, and we spent uh, several hours talking with him. And uh, anyway, here's a testimony here. And uh, it said they received an email request, uh, request from the Middle East uh, an Islamic country, and the note said that they were doing street evangelism, and they said that we know that there's a risk here in this country, but they said this, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, and so they pass out these tracts, amen, right there, and they could give their life up for that. So praise the Lord uh, for Fellowship Track League and the great job that they're doing, and we praise the Lord that we have the opportunity to support that ministry and uh, just hundreds of people are getting saved as a result of that. Let's bow our heads, ask God to bless in the offering tonight. Dear Lord, we're grateful for your goodness to us, Father. We're grateful for what you've done and for providing for us and for the opportunity, Father, that we have to serve you. And Father, we pray that you'll bless in this offering tonight. Help us, Father, as we strive to serve you here in this place, see soul saved. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
final song tonight will be number 176. You can keep your seats for this one. Number 176, Without Him. Without Him I could do nothing. Without Him I'd surely fail. Without Him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. message tonight. Miss Amy Richards and Lisa McLaughlin are going to bring a special for us. Thank you. 
Amen. Amen. We're going to let the children be dismissed. Well, it won't be long. We'll be starting the Iwana ministry again on Wednesday night. We appreciate Mark and Karen taking the kids out during the summer. Amen? I hope that you tell them you appreciate that. Proverbs chapter 19 with me in your Bible. Proverbs chapter 19. And you look so comfortable there, I'm going to let you stay right where you're at. How's that? But if you fall asleep, I'm going to walk right down beside you and wake you up. Proverbs chapter 19, look at verses 8 through 10 with me. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. Delight is not seemly for a fool, much less for a servant to have rule over princes. The theme of these three verses is wisdom is doing the right thing. Wisdom is doing the right thing. So if you do the right thing, that's very wise, in other words. Wisdom is doing the right thing. And so we're going to speak about that from these three verses tonight. Tells us how to do the right thing. And these three verses tonight, how to do the right thing. Wisdom is doing the right thing. How do we do the right thing? We want to speak to you about that for just a few moments tonight. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I pray you would bless your word tonight as we open it up. We study the word of God. I pray, Father, that you would give us understanding. And then most importantly, dear Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight. Help us to be wise. Help us to do the right thing. And dear Lord, I pray that if there's some here tonight that are not doing the right thing. That, Father, they would uh, turn to you, and, Father, they would seek wisdom to do the right thing. And then there may be someone here tonight that needs Christ as their Savior, and I pray that you would save them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading a story about a faculty member who was the dean of a, at a college, and he told about having a dream one night. And in this dream, he dreamed that they were having a faculty meeting at the college, and all the faculty members were there, and all of a sudden, uh, an angel appeared right before him. And the angel said to him, since uh, you have always done the right thing, you've been kind-hearted and so forth, I'm going to give you a choice of one of three things. You can have wisdom, you can have wealth, or you can have good looks. And of course, the, the dean, uh, he didn't think long, because he always did the right thing, and so he said, I'll take the wisdom. And so all of a sudden, he said the light shone down upon him, and the angel disappeared, and he sat there, and some of the other faculty members as he was sitting there, they said, uh, say something, say something. And he looked up in his infinite wisdom, and this is what he said. He said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> I don't know how wise that was. Wisdom is doing the right thing. The person who's wise, they will do the right thing. They will always do the sensible thing. If you are wise... You'll do the sensible thing. You'll do the right thing. And so that's what these verses that we're looking at tonight is talking about. How do we get wisdom? We get wisdom from the Word of God. Amen? Godly wisdom comes from God's Word. And uh, so if we want more wisdom, then we need to stay in the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. Wisdom is doing the right thing. Notice several, notice these verses with me tonight, and we'll see what the wise person does. First of all, the wise seek wisdom. Look at verse 8. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul, and he that keepeth understanding shall find good. So the wise, 
do the right thing by seeking after wisdom. To do the right thing is to seek after wisdom. If you're a wise person, then you're going to seek after wisdom. You're going to want to become wiser. If you're wise, a wise person will want to become wiser. How wise are you? You will want to become wiser. In other words, you'll want to learn from the Word of God. That's why you're here. I think you're wise for being here on Wednesday night. Amen? You're wise for being here because you want to learn the Word of God. In fact, right before the service, some, someone said to me, just before the service, someone said to me, you know what? I want to learn the Bible more. And I said, that's good. I said, I'm glad that you want to learn the Word of God more. You know, that's a wise thing to want to learn the Word of God. Wisdom. Uh, you will seek after wisdom. Solomon had the secret for getting wisdom. He implored God to give him wisdom. Look at what it says here. Getting wisdom. Three things it says in this verse about getting wisdom. Number one, getting wisdom shows that you love your soul. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own what? Soul. So if you get wisdom, you desire to have wisdom. The Bible says you love your own soul. You love your own soul, your eternal soul. Your soul is the real you. It's eternal. It's the real you. We look at the facade. We look at the outside. But the soul is the real you. It's the eternal part of you. This body, if the Lord tarries is coming, it's going to die. It'll grow old. It will die. If the Lord tarries is coming. Uh, but you know what? The soul goes on living, doesn't it? It's eternal. It's forever. And uh, it'll live in heaven or it'll live in hell for eternity. Number two, getting wisdom. Look what it says. It brings good things. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. So when you seek after wisdom, it's going to bring good things to your life. The Bible says when you seek after wisdom. And then number three, getting wisdom will cause a person to make better decisions. When you make better decisions, that will help you to be a greater success. You want to be a success? Get wisdom. Amen? You'll make right decisions. We make wrong decisions all the time because we don't uh, seek the Lord. We don't seek wisdom from God's Word. And uh, so we need to seek wisdom. We need to seek wisdom from the Lord. We can get wisdom. Isn't it something? We can get wisdom the same way that Solomon got wisdom. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. We can get wisdom the same way by seeking wisdom. It from the Lord. In James chapter 1 and verse number 5, the Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Do you know that you can find the answer to every problem in the Word of God? I, you should have had a lot of amens on that. If you study the Word of God, you know what I'm saying. You can find the answer to all the problems in the Word of God. Sometimes it deals with it directly, sometimes indirectly, by giving us the promises from the Word of God. But we can find the answer. Boy, we ought to be studying this book, amen? Because there are a lot of questions, and there are a lot of problems. And so we want to know the answers, we can find them in the Word of God. I spend every week, every week I'm dealing with problems. <laughs> That's my job, dealing with people's problems. I was talking with the staff today, and I said, you know what? There are just lots of problems. And those problems uh, never go away. You think that you've solved all the problems? You think that you've seen every problem? My friend, you've not seen it. Amen? There's going to be more of them coming along. More and more. And uh, you can't say, I've seen everything, because there's going to be something else. Amen? <laughs> there's always something more coming. And uh, we need to know the Word of God. The, the Word of God is an infallible source of wisdom. Amen? The Word of God. It will help us in making decisions. By the way, don't do this. Some people foolishly take and open their Bible up. They have a question They just to flip open the Bible and think they're going to find the answer just la th that way. <laughs> don't do it that way. When we say to study the Word of God, when we say to find the answers in the Word of God, it's not by flipping open, uh, randomly open your Bible up and try to find the answer that way. That's not how you do it. It's methodically uh, and uh, prayerfully and meditatively studying the Word of God. Amen? That's how we do it. Not just flipping the Bible up, say, well, what do you want me to do, Lord? And just flip, open your Bible up and see what it says. That's not how you do it. 
methodically, meditatively, prayerfully studying the Word of God, seeing what God has for you, see what God wants you to do. That's how we can find the answers. Something very interesting I was thinking about as I was writing and studying on this particular passage right here. It seems like when a young person becomes a teenager, they suddenly know everything. They just think they know everything. All of a sudden. You can't tell them anything because they already know it. See, they're smiling over there because they already know what I'm going to say. <laughs> then when they turn about, to, when they get out of high school, all of a sudden they find out they don't know everything. You know what? When they have to start making a living and they st have to pay for the car insurance and pay for the car and pay for the gas in the car. They say, where'd that money come from before? Where'd that gas come from before? Have to have their own place to live. Have to pay the rent. Have to pay the bills, the electric, the water. I thought that stuff was all free. No, you have to pay for it. And you have to have a job to pay for it. And they finally realize, hey, I don't know everything. <laughs> Who's been paying for all of this? Somebody's been paying for it. But they think they know it all. And then they finally realize they don't know it all. Then there comes another time in life when sometimes middle age, sometimes older than that, people think they know it all again, don't they? You can't tell them anything. They know it all. Paul said he was fearful that in his old age he would become a castaway. <laughs> That's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. They think that they know it all. Listen, we never come to the place where we know it all. Amen? We need to continue to get wise. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. It comes from the Word of God. You want wisdom, get into the Word of God. Every morning I get up very early in the morning, I study the Bible. Then I study for hours here, working on messages, studying the Word of God. Listen, folks, we never come to the place where we have arrived. We need to continue to get wisdom. If you're wise, we can tell. You can tell how wise you are if you're trying to get wisdom. Amen? How wise are you? Are you having your devotions? Do you take time every day to read the Word of God? If you do, I'll tell you what you're wise. But if you don't, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand here tonight if you're having your devotions or not, but I'll tell you it's a wise person that's having their devotions. If you're wise, you'll open the Bible up. And I'll tell you what, moms and dads, if you have children at home, listen, you're wise if you'll open the Bible up in front of your children and read the Word of God. There's wisdom, seeking wisdom. We've never arrived. We need to uh, seek wisdom. That's what the Bible says. The wise seek wisdom. Are you seeking wisdom? If you want to finish this life well, then it's good for us to journey with the Lord every single day. Every day. I was reading about a man, he's a Greek artist by the name of Timotheus, and uh, he had hired a tutor he was a gifted painter, but he hired a tutor to teach him, and, uh, and he did very well. He painted a, a portrait, and it was a beautiful portrait that he painted. And uh, every day he would come and he would just stare at that painting that he painted. Every single day after he painted it, he thought it was a great work. It took him months to paint it. He thought it was just wonderful. And so every day he would come in, and he would just look at that portrait that he had painted. Well, one day he came in, and the tutor had painted all over that painting. <laughs> he took one look at it and said, what did you do? He said, you've destroyed my painting. And he wept. He said, I can't believe that you did that. 
And the tutor said, well, I did it for your own good. He said, uh, you stop progressing. You stop trying to improve. And so I did it for your own good. He said it was a, it was a very good painting. But he said it wasn't a perfect painting. He said, now I want you to paint it again. And so he worked and he painted it again. And after he painted it again, it became a masterpiece. In fact, the fact of the matter is, they say it's one of the finest paintings in antiquity. It's called The Sacrifice of Infigenia. And uh, it became a masterpiece. But you know what? He had stopped. He had stopped progressing. He had stopped growing. He had stopped going forward. And many times in our Christian life, we stop. We think that we've arrived. We think that we know everything. My friend, we've never come to that place, let me tell you. If you're wise, you're going to continue to seek wisdom. Wisdom comes from the Word of God. Amen? If you're wise, you're seeking wisdom tonight. That's what the Bible says. Wisdom is doing what? The right thing. Amen? Wisdom is doing the right thing. The wise, first of all, seek wisdom. Now notice secondly here, in verse number 9. Here's a good one. The wise tell the truth. A false witness shall not be unpunished. I want you to listen very carefully to this. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. The wise do the right thing by telling the truth. Wise people are impeccably honest. If you are wise, you will always tell the truth. Did you hear me? If you are wise, you will always tell the truth. The truth. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. Wherefore, putting away the lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Those who are fools are false witnesses. It talks about false witness. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall perish. False witnesses are fools. A false witness is one who lies, one who does not tell the truth. Notice what it says there. Do you see the word there? What does it say? It says, a false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall what? Perish. What does that mean? word perish mean it means divine judgment look what it goes we go back to the first phrase a false witness shall not be unpunished and then he that speaketh lies shall perish it's talking about facing divine judgment judgment from god several other verses that go along with that in proverbs chapter 21 and verse 28 a false witness shall perish the bible says now Let me take a poll. I can take a poll. Everybody else takes polls. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here it is. Here it is. Here's a poll. Do you believe if you tell a lie that you'll be punished? How many believe? Let me ask you this. If you don't believe that, then fine. But let me ask you this. How many believe that if you tell a lie, that you'll face divine judgment? Let me see your hands. How many believe that? I think that's everybody in here. Okay, thank you. Then why would you tell a lie? If you really believe that, why would you tell a lie? People do, don't they? But if you really believe that, and I really believe it. Listen, you might think you're getting away with something today. 
But eventually, it's going to come, it's going to come home to roost. So eventually, you're going to pay for that. If it's not here, it will be in eternity. We shouldn't lie, should we? We should not lie. We should tell the truth. But some people, they lie. They lie about all different kinds of things. They're false witness, even for the Lord. There's an interesting story, and in, I've been reading in my devotions in the morning. I've been reading in the book of Acts. I was reading about when Paul was there in Ephesus, and he started the church at Ephesus. They were rioting there. Do you remember reading that there in Acts, and how they were rioting there in Acts chapter 19? You read that. It's a very interesting story. I... In the last few days, I've been reading that for my devotions there in Acts chapter 19, 20, and so forth. But the story talks about a guy by the name of Alexander, and uh, he was a, a coppersmith. And it also tells about Demetrius, who was a silversmith. But Alexander, the thing about Alexander is this. Alexander had made a profession of faith. And he once had been a, he's a very outspoken individual, very uh, good spokesperson. And at one time he spoke for the cause of Christ, but now he had turned his back on the Lord and he had just made a profession of faith. He wasn't a true believer. <laughs> and Paul was there in, at Ephesus. He had started this church. People were being saved left and right. So many people were being saved that there was a riot. The riot was caused actually by a fellow by the name of Demetrius the silversmith. He was upset because people were getting saved and they no longer wanted to worship Diane, a goddess. They, had a, they actually had there in Ephesus a, a temple to Diana. And uh, it was... Uh, uh, the temple of Artemis is what it was called. And they would actually go in there and do immoral, ungodly type of worship, worshiping uh, Diana. Diana. But the people, as a result of getting converted, getting saved, they were doing away with their idols. And these coppersmiths and these silversmiths would make idols, and the people would worship those little idols. And so they were upset because people were getting saved and they weren't buying those anyway. That's the way they made their living. And so they were mad. They were mad at Paul. They wanted to do away with Paul. And uh, Demetrius, he led this riot of all these artisans against the Apostle Paul. So the whole city was thrown into confusion. They actually, to tell you how bad it got, is they went to the Colise Colosseum there in Ephesus, and I was reading that Colosseum would hold 20,000 people. There were 20,000 people in the Colosseum, and they wanted to do away with Paul. Paul wanted to go in there into the Colosseum and talk to these people, and his friends were pulling him back saying, don't go in there, they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you if you go in there. Don't go in there. The people were rioting. And uh, they held Paul back. But what was interesting, there were Jews. Of course, Ephesus was a Roman city. There were many Jews there, and they were afraid of, uh, that the Romans were going to come after them. And uh, because of anti-Semitism in that day, because that was a Roman city. And so what they did, they got Alexander, who had at one time professed Christ and he no longer, they actually brought him and pushed him in front to speak on their behalf against Paul, in other words. Paul, the Apostle Paul said of Alexander in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 19 and 20 that he had made the, he said our, he had made our faith a shipwreck. That's what he said about Alexander. Not only that, but he said now he is blaspheming. 
He was speaking blasphemy. Speaking against the cause of Christ. Bitter words. The Apostle Paul actually said this about him. At first he gave him over to the devil. Many people, didn't, they didn't like that, that he gave him over to the devil. Then, in 1 Timothy, he, when he's writing to Timothy, he gave him over to the devil. In 2 Timothy, he gave him over to the Lord to punish him and to judge him. Those passages in, uh, over in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 14 and 15, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Let God take care of him. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. He became a tool of the devil. Became a false witness. He was a liar. Paul gave him over to the devil. Then he gave him over to the Lord, for the Lord to punish him. Why, he's a liar and God's going to punish him, amen? <laughs> God will punish all liars. You might think you're getting away with it, but it never... You know what? It's going to catch up to you, amen? It will catch up to you. That's the whole point. People lie and then they think, oh, wow, I've gotten away with it. They breathe a, breathe a sigh of relief, but you're not getting away with it. It will catch up to you. I was reading about uh, the wildebeest in, in Africa. They have terrible droughts there, and they say that these wildebeest will be in this famished place where they're having droughts, and uh, it'll start raining in northern Africa, and uh, the rivers will overflow there, and in southern Africa, it'll be very hot and dry and drought conditions, and so these wildebeest will begin to migrate north. And they say it's what's interesting about it is they don't just mosey to the north to the rivers, but they will run full blast. It's very interesting. They will run. They will come in small herds. Small herds will gather, and they will start running together. More small herds and more small herds and more. And they will begin. They said that they will run like a marathon. They will run full blast to get water, to get to this water. And I could hardly believe it, but they said that there would be as many as two million of those wildebeest running full blast to this river. And they say what's interesting is when they run to this river, the baboons are up in the trees and the baboons watch them coming. And they begin to stir and they know what's going to happen when they get to the river. These wildebeest will run and they'll run to the river and when they get to the river, they say that they will stop. Rather than you think that they would just charge into the river, but they don't, they stop. And then a few at a time will begin to go into the river. And then, and then after the other wildebeest see them go into the river, then they will go in mass into the river. And the baboons are up in the tree, and they say they're making all kinds of noise because they know what's going to happen. You say, well, what's going to happen? The crocodiles are in the river. And the crocodiles are under the water waiting Every year, they say they do the same thing, and they wait for them to get into the river, and when they're all into the river, then they tear them limb from limb, they say. They can't swallow them whole, so they tear them limb from limb. And the baboons all knew that this was going to happen. But the wildebeest continued to do the same thing. But for just a moment, they're in the water, they're refreshed, and they think, wow, we're refreshed, it's wonderful. But then they're torn limb from limb. What are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm trying to say just this. The divine judgment of God, amen, will come. You might think that you're relaxed and refreshed. You got away with that lie, but my friend, you will not get away with it. That is the truth. Those who are wise tell the truth. They always tell the truth. Are you wise? How wise are you? The wise will tell the truth. The wise 
seek wisdom. Do you seek wisdom? Do you always tell the truth? The wise always do the right thing. Then lastly, look at verse number 10. The wise are gracious. Look what it says, delight not, delight is not seemly for a fool, much less for a servant to have rule over princes. The wise do the right thing by being gracious. The wise do the right thing by being gracious. Look at the word delight there. You know that word delight? See the word delight there? The word delight means to be pleasant or gracious. So what it's saying here, when it says delight is not seemly for a fool, it's saying uh, uh, the point is that fools are not usually gracious. <laughs> if you're a fool, you're not gracious. But the wise are gracious. The wise are always gracious. What does it mean to be gracious? It means to show mercy. It means to be kind. If you're wise, you will be kind, you will be gracious, you will be merciful if you're wise. I was talking with someone today in my office about this very thing. They say they always try to be gracious, they always try to do right, and people do wrong to them. And they're thinking about, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that. I said, yes, you should do that, because that's a wise thing for you to do. It is wise for you to be gracious, and always gracious. Even when people are not kind, and even when people do, don't do right, if you're wise, you will always be gracious. If we could only be wise... On the other hand, fools are not gracious. <laughs> They're not kind. They want to take advantage of you. But the wise are always gracious. They show kindness. They show mercy. The best example is our Lord. How gracious and kind is He to us. We don't deserve it, do we? Not a one of us deserve it. And God is gracious to us. We ought to follow His example. I look at the example of the Lord dealing with the children of Israel for 40 years wandering, and the Lord was gracious to them. They did not deserve it, did they? They didn't deserve a single thing, and yet He was so gracious to them. He showed mercy on them for 40 years in the wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and verses 2 and 3, I don't have time to read that passage, but you can write it down where it talks about how He took care of them, provided food for them, provided clothing and shoes for them. God took care of them. He showed His mercy. They didn't deserve it. And God shows His mercy and kindness and graciousness to us. And we don't deserve it. Don't you like the story of the, uh, the, the servant there in Matthew chapter 18? He owed his, I figured that out one time. I preached the message about that, that unjust servant. He, his boss forgave him of all of his debts. I figured it was over a million dollars in today's money that he would have owed his boss, the Lord, his master. And he forgave him of that debt. And then what did he do? He turned around. There was a man that owed him some money and he turned him into jail. He was a fool, wasn't he? He was unjust. He was, took advantage of others. We should be grace, gracious. You can tell. Sometimes we as fundamental independent Baptists have not been known to be very gracious about things. Do you know what? We ought to be gracious. We ought to be kind, we ought to be merciful. I know. I told you today, I had someone in my office and they were talking about how people had mistreated them and so forth and they're just thinking about...